Good afternoon, Pedal Harvey family. Today is July the 8th, 2020. This is our Wednesday afternoon Bible study. I want to give you a few things that might help you just to kind of stay informed. Uh, this Sunday on July the 12th, we're going to start back into phase two of our reopening strategy. Now what that's going to mean is that we're going to have two services on Sunday morning. One will be at 9 o'clock, the other will be at 11 o'clock. And then sandwiched in between that, we're going, to try to, we're going to try to have Sunday school. And so that'll start at 10 o'clock. Those Sunday school classes will meet in their rooms. They'll be spread out. They'll be sprayed down and sanitized and all of that. And so we're going to use the month of July to kind of slowly start rolling back into Sunday school. Now, for those of you that are ready to come back, what I'd like to remind you is please, would you go ahead and would you make some reservations for what service you're gonna attend? Remember, we like to keep those capacities low and spread out for social distancing. And uh, we also wanna just kind of be able to know uh, the, the crowd size of each of that for sanitation purposes. Now, if you're not ready to come back, it's okay. Listen, we love you. We, we look forward to the day we get to see you. But if you're going to still stay home and be part of our, our internet congregation, would you just be mindful and prayerful of this very important week for us? Now, because we always want you to know good things that are going on, I want to show you what the Lord did for us on Sunday. Why don't you watch real quick as we, uh, as we show you who the Lord brought into our family. Good morning, church family. It's right after our 11 o'clock service. This is Miss Sandra McNeil. Uh, Miss Sandra's been with us visiting for a while now. Uh, she comes this morning to join our church family, and we're thrilled about that. She knows the Lord. Uh, she loves the Lord. She's been baptized, and she's coming by transfer of letter from a sister Baptist church, and we're thrilled to have her. If you're excited about that, comment below and tell her how grateful you are for her, and keep praying for her, and uh, we'll see you soon. It's always exciting when the Lord adds to our home. You know, Sunday morning after our 11 o'clock service, not only did we have somebody join, I got a phone call before I'd even left campus that somebody had just prayed to receive Jesus and gotten saved and they wanted to let me know and very soon they're going to let you know. And so it's a wonderful day. Take your Bible now and let's go to 2 Kings chapter number 2. 2 Kings chapter number 2. As we've studied the life of Elijah, what we've begun to see is that the Lord is, is at work and active in the lives of his people. Now what's interesting then is if we assume that the Lord was working in the life of Elijah on behalf of ministering to these people, we are really then begin to ask, why does so much attention focus on a king and Elijah or a king and a captain, a king and Elijah and a captain and a, and a prophet? Why these major figures? Because in the undercurrent of it all, we're supposed to be, act, we're supposed to be asking ourselves, if the people who are, who are in a place of prominence are living like they're living, What's the average person doing? And really, in that, own, in that situation, then we start asking our question, our question about ourselves. How are we living? You see, we open our Bibles and we come to realize, studying this life of Elijah, that, that probably for six uninterrupted decades, evil had prevailed in Israel. There was bloodshed and murder and immorality and conspiracy and hatred and idolatry uh, characterized by its kingdom and its leaders. And then from stage right enters in the prophet named Elijah. And his name means the Lord is my God. I like Elijah. Uh, I, I like the fact how one person put it. He stood for everything right in a culture that fell for everything wrong. Charles Swindoll once put it like this. He said that the spiritual chasm at this point in history, the spiritual chasm between God and his people was at an all-time uh, wide breadth. But then Elijah himself stood alone in the gap. And what if today God still looks for people who are willing to stand for him even if they have to stand alone? Now, as the scriptures have recorded his story, it's not even uh, tried to gloss over the hard details. Uh, it's not glossed over even for one minute on his human weaknesses or his fear or his doubts or his learned reliance upon God. How does a man go from just meeting God to having the kind of faith that Elijah seems to display in his life? I tell you this, it didn't happen in an afternoon. It didn't happen with Elijah in an afternoon. Uh, it happened over the long haul of learned dependence. 
Elijah learned how to trust God sitting by the brook Cherith for a year and, and spending two years being fed every day from flour and oil that, that refused to ever run dry in a widow's house. And then back to Mount Sinai where the covenant was given. Elijah learned to trust God over the long haul of having nowhere else to look but looking to God. I think that's the way we do it too. It's about the long haul. Through the pages of two books now, we've seen Elijah as uncompromisingly strong, yet self-controlled. Disciplined, yet forgiving. Audaciously courageous, yet kind. Heroic in battle, and yet humble in the aftermath. Now, his life was never free from conflict. As a matter of fact, in most of the things that he did, it caused even more conflict. But in a world that easily loses its way, we need more believers like Elijah. We need men and women who will be not afraid to boldly live among the people around them uh, while they are in love with God. We need people to boldly live for the Lord like that so others can see. Now this passage is really the recording of what happens when a soldier who's been at war has been told he can come home. This is the story of Elijah going to heaven. I want to read it to you. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 1. We're going to begin in verse number 1. Here's what the Bible says. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And so he answered him, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood at the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and he struck the water. And it was divided this way and that way, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, What may I do for you? before I am taken away from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so, but if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened, as they continued and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by whirlwind into heaven. You know, when I was in high school, uh, one of my teachers uh, told the class that we were going to read Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Now, I'll say this. I, I read it. Uh, I think I read most of it. Uh, but I, I read it, and it wasn't a highlight of my literary career, not to think my most favorite thing we ever read in school. But it, but it did teach me something. It taught me that titles matter. Uh, the title of the play is not Romeo and Juliet. The title of the play is The Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. It also taught me that beginnings to a thing matter. Now they don't always determine where they end, where something ends up, but I'll tell you what beginnings do have the responsibility of doing. Beginnings at least have the responsibility of informing where you go next. And so I remember reading Romeo and Juliet, and I, and I got past the first two lines pretty quick, but I didn't remember them to the end. Now here's what it says. It says, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. For from the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their lives, whose misadventured piteous overthrows do with their death bury their parents' strife. Now here's, here's, what, they, here's what Shakespeare is saying. He's saying that there's two families at war with each other in Italy. They don't get along. They hate each other. They're fighting all the time. They're the Hatfields and they're the McCoys. 
but one Hatfield boy falls in love with one McCoy girl, and uh, and they they're so in love, they're ready to get married. They're going to run away together, and everything looks great. As a matter of fact, when you keep reading Romeo and Juliet, the the story of how they love each other, the story of the plans they make for their future, they run off, they get married. And, uh, and it all, man, it's great. And you, you start reading that thing and you're rooting for them. You, man, I want it to turn out great for these two. We want things to go great. But at the end of the story, they both die. It shouldn't have shocked us because the very first two sentences of the whole play said, hey, listen, no matter how good things look, by the end of this thing, both Romeo and Juliet will be dead and they're gonna have taken their own lives. Now you read that thing and you go, good grief, how did, how did I miss that beginning? Well, it reminds me a whole lot of what we have when we open chapter number two. The very first line in chapter number two says, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And so you read this story, and it doesn't matter how, how much Elijah does or how much Elisha wants him to stay or how many things we could think of or how much more Elijah could have done. The first verse tells you by the end of this story, he's going to be gone. Now, when you take this story and you begin to, to, to divide it into its, its manageable pieces, it, you start back with verses 1 and 2. That, that's going to kind of be the foundation. So verse 1 tells us that the whirlwind uh, is going to take Elijah, and it says they went from Gilgal. Then look in verse 2. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now, this is going to be the last of the long walks that Elijah is going to take with Elisha, his young protege. Now, if you're having trouble with these two names, I know that in English they sound very much the same. Uh, Elijah and Elisha, and we get them confused. In Hebrew, their, their names are pretty different. Um, but that doesn't come across well in translation. I always remember it like this. Elijah comes before Elisha because Elijah has a J and Elisha has an S and the J always becomes comes before the S. That's just how I remember it, but listen, I'm simple that way. And so you, you, can, you can figure it out yourself how you want to do it. But uh, you can imagine there'd be tons of young prophets who would have killed for what Elisha uh, had been able to experience now. Surely they wanted to walk with Elijah and be taught by Elijah. They wanted to see his miracles and learn about the Lord from him. But Elisha alone makes the trip. Now what's important about that is this is no subtle way of the Lord telling us that even though Elijah will leave, you better stay tuned because Elisha is in the batter's box next. It's a good reminder that people may finish, but God doesn't finish. All in all, this journey wasn't just a casual stroll. Uh, like other moments in his leadership, uh, this really all served a purpose. Now go back to verse number 1. Verse number 1 says, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now let's just stop. I want you to, I'm just kind of tell you up front, the way Romeo and Juliet did, I'm going to tell you up front. What's happening in this passage is a series of four different steps, of four different places, and I believe the final four tests of Elisha before he's ready to take on the role as the prophet. The first stop is, uh, from verse number one, the first stop is in Gilgal. Now, Gilgal was the place that you might remember if you're, you remember studying your, your Old Testament history. Gilgal's the place where Israel made camp as soon as they crossed into the Promised Land for the first time. So it was there at Gilgal where at least 12 Israelites had picked up 12 huge stones from inside the Jordan River. When God dried it up, he, he, they all take these stones. And in Gilgal, they set up these stones as a massive pile, as a remembrance pile. Joshua told him to do this because he said in the years to come, your kids are going to ask you, what are these rocks here for? And basically, Joshua was going to answer, uh, it was so that future generations would not be able to forget what God did in redeeming his people. Matter of fact, his words in Joshua 4 says, this is so that all the peoples on earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty and so that you may always fear the Lord your God. But see, when you, when you read this story, if you listen carefully, you can almost hear Elijah retelling the history 
of Gilgal as he walks around. Imagine walking Elisha around this city of Gilgal, pointing out landmarks, pointing out this huge uh, tower of rocks, pointing out where buildings, almost like a tour guide walking him through there and telling him how the, the miracles of God had gotten Israel to that point. Did you know that at Gilgal, it was also the place where God commanded that the new generation of Israelites, after the one generation had all passed away after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they move into Gilgal. Gilgal is where the new generation was circumcised into covenant with God. It was a symbol that separated flesh signified the, the, the joining of covenant with God. And I wonder if in that, did Elijah bring Elisha to Gilgal to tell him that if he was going to continue following God as the prophet, he too was going to have to deny his flesh in order to follow You know, we've heard probably over and over all of our Christian lives that the flesh has no place in the spiritual life. If anything, the flesh is going to be an added weight that, that trips you up later. Even our Lord Jesus will come back on this same theme and He'll say it like this. He'll say that we're, to, we're supposed to take up our cross daily and follow Him. Well, what was the cross if not an instrument of death to the flesh? And maybe it means that if we're not willing to let our flesh die or our flesh be denied, then we're, we're never really going to truly be able to follow him. And I wonder if that's why in verse number 2, Elijah tells Elisha, he says, stay here. He said, the Lord has sent me on, but why don't you stay here? What if this is a test? What if the teacher is still testing the student to see how far he's willing to go for God? And he's saying that, that Elisha, if you keep going, God, it's going to cost you to follow God. It's going to be hard some days, it's going to be tough some days, and it's going to cost you. Elisha, you could stay here. Elisha, look how easy it is here. You could stay right here. You could, you could just stop right now if you wanted to. What if this is his last test? And Elisha looks around Gilgal and he goes, No. He said, I just assume as, as we've started this journey, we're going to finish this journey with the Lord. He said, So I'm going with you all the way. What if when we read this story, the teacher testing his students is really testing us? I mean, what about you? What would you do? Are you willing to deny the flesh so that you can follow Jesus completely? Let's just ask this. When was the last time you really felt like you had to deny your flesh to follow Jesus? When was the last time you had to say, no, I, I can't do that. I won't do that. I will not do that. I'm not going to stay like that because I'm going to follow Jesus and he requires more of me. And if you've never had to give up anything for the flesh in order to follow Jesus, have you really started following Jesus? It's a profound question, but I think it's question number one for a disciple. Is Jesus enough? Or are you going to hold on to something else? Look in verse number two. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. And so they go down to Bethel. Now, Bethel translates in your Bible, it's, it's two Hebrew words. It's, it's Bet and El. So the Beth and then the El. Beth means house. El means God. So Bethel means this is the house of God. It, it roughly translates to house of God uh, because probably because of all the holy things that had happened there. Now, if you've forgotten, let me just remind you. Bethel was the place where Abraham built his very first altar to God. Bethel was also the place that Abraham ran back to after he lied in Egypt about, you know, Sarah being his wife. They had to run out of Egypt. Bethel is where they came back to. Bethel is also the place where uh, Jacob laid his head on a rock and he saw a ladder going up to heaven with the angels ascending and descending uh, from heaven. That all happened in Bethel. The house of God here was a holy place. But what if Elijah left Gilgal to go to Bethel so that he could take Elisha to show him what the house of God had become left in man's hands? Because when they got there, what Elisha learns is that Bethel had become the primary focal point for calf worship in Israel, of all things. 
but it's it's where you could have found uh, the worship of golden calves, the way the Israelites had had fashioned the golden calf in the wilderness and bowed down to it. That idolatrous practice had still occurred. And matter of fact, they used those kind of that, that same imagery there in Bethel. And so it all kind of connects back to this idolatrous past. But when you walk through Gil when you walk through Bethel, You'll notice, you'll notice how they had even upgraded from there. Bethel was the place where the first northern king, Jeroboam, he had set up the main place of worship. So there was a, there was a, a, a temple in Jerusalem, but so Jeroboam set up his own little temple in Bethel. And he set it up and he brings in false priests and false Levites and false worship and false idols. Uh, Bethel had become a place where you could be spiritual. You could be religious and you could coast. And you could be spiritual and you could be religious, but you didn't necessarily have to be godly. You ever heard people talk about it? You know, I, I don't, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a Christian or I don't know about, you about that, but, but I am spiritual. Well, Bethel would have been a fantastic place for him. Bethel was the kind of place where a man could could settle in his religion and just kind of uh, just kind of kind of coast through. It had all the looks of religion. It had worship services. It had offerings. It had sacrifices. It had all these things. But we'll tell you what it did not have: the one true God. And so it had all of these trappings, but none of the power. You know, people are still like that. They say the right things. They they might attend the right services, but they can still be wrong with God. And what if this place is a test in its own right for Elisha? What if Elijah takes the young prophet and he brings him to a place where there are massive places of worship and good offerings and the priests are in good clothes and they, 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 they do all sorts of religious activity? And what if Elijah looks at him and shows him what man's religion has become? And he looks at him and he says, Elisha, why don't you stay here? Elisha, would you be willing to stay here? And why don't, why don't you be, be religious? He said, Elisha, if you stay here and be religious, you won't have to live the hard life I've lived. You won't have conflict. You won't have trouble. Look how happy these people are. Look how, look how they live their lives. They do whatever they want. They, as long as they go to church, they live however they want to. He said, Elisha, if you, just, if you stayed here, life would be easy. And Elisha looks around and he goes, no, this is no place for me. And what he's saying is that, in essence, to stay there would have been lesser. It would have been a fake. It would have been a phony. It did not work. It, it wasn't what he wanted. Because Elisha said, I want to go where God is. And I want to be there in a way that's true, in a way that's faithful. And I just wonder this. I, what would you do? I mean, would you be willing to be religious and even be blessed, but not have God. I'm fearful that many of us would love God's blessings richly poured out on us, but we don't necessarily need God. Some people want to serve God so that they may be blessed. Well, what if you could have all of your blessings, but not have God? What, would, you, would you go after them? Some would. Elisha said no, and he said, this is not where I want to stay. Now look in verse 4. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. So now in verse 4, they go on to Jericho. Most of us recognize Jericho, certainly. It's the city that Israel faced when they began their conquest of the Promised Land. It had massive walls with massive supports, but God brought it down with a, with a shout and the walls came tumbling down. Maybe you can, almost, uh, you can almost picture it in your mind where Elijah is pointing out crumbled ruins and kind of things all around Jericho and he's pointing out all of those details to Elisha. Did you know that today the, the city of Jericho is considered the longest inhabited city in the world? And certainly why wouldn't it be? Who wants to leave a place where great victory has happened? We want to stay in our victories. We don't want to walk away from them. It's like this. Have you ever, you ever noticed a formal, former athlete, how he might hold on to his glory days? Maybe a, a former high school football star showing up to a big university, and he's gone from being a big fish in a little pond to a, a little fish in a great big pond, and he walks on campus as a freshman in college wearing his letterman jacket and, 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 and hoping he's still that big man on campus. And you, go, you look at him and you go, dude, you got to let it go. 
Let's move on. There's something about letting go of the past, especially a past of victory, that's, that's very hard to do. So what if Elijah is really asking Elisha, he said, Elisha, why don't you stay back here in the glory days? Why don't you cling to victories of the, of the past? Because the past is already set and everybody's happy about what happened in the past. But in the future, he said, Elisha, there are going to be some hard days and hard decisions and they're not always going to be popular. Why don't you stay here where everything is happy and victorious and, and wonderful historically? He said, Elisha, there, there's hard days in the road ahead. And again, Elisha passes the test and he, he keeps moving. See, all of us, Lord willing, are going to have some moments of blessing and victory. And then we're going to have to decide, am I going to retire there in our victory? We're going to coast on to heaven? Or am I going to keep waking up every day, getting ready for battle, and serving my Lord until the day He takes me home? That's the path Elijah had chosen. Now it's the one Elisha chooses. Look in verse 6. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But Elisha says, there he says, As the Lord lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Do you remember the old hymn you used to sing when you were a kid? Uh, on Jordan's stormy banks. Now here, here's the deal. I, I remember singing uh, hymns right out of the hymnal in my uh, in my church when I was a kid, and I loved it. I, I have gone back to some of those churches that uh, that that I grew up in, and they still do that. And I've I've often found that uh, my memory of that is is a whole lot better than the the actual usage of that um, but I, I do man I still I still love those songs I do love how we kind of modernize the sound of them a bit but I remember I remember this that no matter what hymn we sang because we we're Baptist we always sang the first verse the second verse and then the fourth verse that poor third verse nobody ever knew it but the fourth the fourth verse of on Jordan stormy banks says this it says when shall I read that happy place and be forever blessed when shall I see my father's face and in his bosom rest? The song was about crossing the Jordan, uh, but it was a symbol. In the Bible, crossing the Jordan has always been the symbol of that which you got to cross in order to get to the promised land. And the symbol of in order to get to heaven, you got to cross the banks, the river of death before you get there. So Jordan was always a kind of a symbol of death you even find oh, where did john the baptist baptize people and he why did he baptize he baptized immersion why because uh, they were buried with christ well buried in the jordan i mean it didn't take a, a theologian to figure out that significance and then raised to the newness of life and they come out of the jordan there's all of that symbolism ties in so jordan being the uh, the symbol for death there this is elijah's last spot from here, Elijah will be called up in the whirlwind and he'll go to heaven. But what if the last question that he's got for his young protege is, Elisha, are you willing to die every day to be the kind of person that God can use? And Elisha said, yes. You know, dying daily is something each of us have the choice of. I can either live my life or God, Christ, can live His life through me. But listen, we can't do both. That's why the Apostle Paul is going to say, I, I die daily. So Elisha is being taken. He says, what if following God means that I'm going to have to die? Old John the Baptist even took this up. He says, you know, he says, let me put it like this. In order to live my life the right way, I've got to decrease. He's got to increase. And so what about you? You willing to die daily? Elijah goes to heaven this day, but the exit, the, the walk, was as much of a lesson as, as the rest of it. Elisha passed his test, uh, but Elijah finished his race. He fought the good fight. His journey was over. But yours isn't. You're still here. And so if you took the same walk down these same paths from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan, are you willing to go the whole way? I hope you are. I want to encourage you to do it. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Would you bless today? Help us to be faithful followers of Jesus where every step of the journey, let us be faithful, let us be in love with Jesus, and let us be committed to the very end. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We'll see you soon, friends.